Okay, we have about two minutes to go. It looks like everybody is probably here. So why don't we get started? Um, I want to Mary, welcome. Yes. Mary, sorry, let me mute everybody. Oh, then, okay. All right. So. Okay. Okay. Okay, I want to uh, welcome everyone to our February 14th Hot Topic event. This is a really special day for the league because we are celebrating our 102nd anniversary today. Uh, 1920, Carrie Chapman Catt founded the League of Women Voters because she anticipated that the 19th Amendment would be ratified in a number of months and it was important for women who had never voted to have some voter education, know what to do with the polls, and since then, we have really grown into an organization that doesn't just do voter education. We do everything from climate change to social policies. We are represented in the UN. Um, so we've, we've come a long way. And a third, I think a third of our members actually in Lehigh County are men. So we, um, we've done a good job of spreading our, our purpose and our mission. Okay, today we have two really important people in our community here to talk to us about the opioid and other drug crises that uh, are occurring in the Lehigh Valley. Um, it is a Lehigh Valley issue, it's a state issue, it's a national issue, but what happens with Allentown and Shannon, I'm sure we'll go into this, is we have people that come into Allentown from other areas and I'd be willing to bet that over the years, almost every municipality in the Lehigh County and beyond has been treated and taken care of by the city of Allentown EMS when they come into the city to buy drugs and wind up overdosing or getting very sick. So we'll be really, really anxious to hear what she has to tell us. The other person who's here to speak to us is Bill Stoffer, who is an expert on everything um, related to addiction from treatment to recovery to recovery services, and he is a champion for changing policy on how people are treated, how recovery services are important, and what is involved in what we call harm reduction. I have, um, you know, one of the other things I do besides the league is uh, recovery work. I am cer state certified in a course that Bill created that helps families navigate the recovery process for themselves and for members of their family that may be in active addiction or early recovery. So Chris is going to give you a bio of both of them. You're gonna learn a lot. This is something that has to come out of the shadows and we all have to understand what it is and get rid of the stigma of drug addiction. Okay, with that, Chris, do you wanna give us an introduction and then Shannon, you can start us off. Hi, um, Shannon Scoble, who is our first presenter is a certified critical care paramedic who works full-time for the city of Allentown and part-time for Penn Star flight team with the hospital of the University of Pennsylvania. She's been a paramedic for 11 years and teaches advanced cardiac life support, pediat pediatric advanced life support, and paramedic students, the emergency medic Medicine Institute in Allentown in her, and in her free time, Ms. Goble is completing her nursing degree at Bucks County Community College. And our second presenter is Bill Stauffer. Bill Stauffer has been the executive director of Pennsylvania Recovery Organization Alliance, PRO-A, the statewide recovery organization of Pennsylvania. He's in a long-term recovery. He's in long-term recovery since age 21, and has been actively engaged in public policy in the recovery er arena for most of those years. He's also an adjunct professor of social work at Misericordia University in Dallas, and an adjunct and an he holds a bachelor's degree in social work from Cedar Crest College and a master's of social work from Kutztown University. Mr. Stauffer has been a staunch advocate for strong SUD substance abuse disorder, patient private protections at both the state and federal levels for years. 
He was recipient of the Vernon Johnson Award Individual Recovery Advocate of the Year in 2019. In 2002, he received the Leslie G. Mitchell Prize in Social Work. Mr. Stauffer received the Pennsylvania Recovery Organization Alliance Award of the Recovery Advocate of the Year in 2008. Bill lives in Allentown with his wife, Julie, and dogs, Tweek and Ella. In his free time, he loves wandering in the woods, taking photos, bird watching, and reading everything he can get his hands on. Thank you both for being with us today. Shannon? Hi, everybody. Um, so as you've heard, my name is Shannon Scoble. Um, I work night shift at the city of Allentown out of the Center City Fire Station at 7th and Chew. Um, so we are very busy ambulance. Um, our department does about um, 17, in 2021, we did 17,000 calls um, between four trucks. And if our pace keeps up this year, we're on track to do about 20,000 calls between four trucks. So we are a very, very busy organization. Um, there, we don't have a lot of downtime there. Um, and we work <clears throat> very closely with our fire department and our police department. So um, just to kick us off, I do have some statistics for everybody. Um, in 2019, we had uh, let's see, 419 overdoses. Now this isn't broken down. Um, I was just able to pull the numbers from 2019 last night. Um, there, this is all just combined. Um, so 2019, we had 419 overdoses total. In 2020, we had um, 569 overdoses. And then in 2021, I was able to break it down in separate categories. So we had in 2021, we had a total of 1,101 overdoses. Um, 445 of those were heroin. 181 of those were K2. And then 475 of those were other categories. Um, they're just uh, a broad category of ingestion poisoning, such as like um, alcohol or PCP, any, anything else that we would categorize it under. Um, <clears throat> And then so far in 2022, in the last month and a half, we've, we've had a total of 119, 55 of those being heroin, 12 being K2, and then 52 of those being other ingestion and poisonings. Now, <clears throat> as far as accuracy, um, some people, we do have like a biosurveillance category for heroin documentation. So we could be dispatched to an unresponsive person that we know is going to be a heroin overdose based on the information that we get from our dispatchers. Uh, so we get there and the person is a heroin overdose, we treat them and transport them to the hospital. The dispatch category in our charting system is labeled as an unresponsive person or an ingestion poisoning. And then when we get back, we are supposed to change it um, accordingly. Uh, some people leave it as an unresponsive person. Some people change it to ingestion poisoning or some people use the biosurveillance all the way at the top to the heroin um, category. And that's how we are able to track it accordingly. So some people don't use that biosurveillance bio thing at the very top and that's how, um, that's how our data kind of gets skewed. Um, but we're able to run like a total number, if you will, at the very end of the year. And that's how we come up with like a, a broad category of overdoses. Um, but the, the information gets skewed. We're not able to break it down into separate categories if people don't document properly. But so far in 2000 and 2020, excuse me, 2022, we've had a total of 119 overdoses total. Um, so we are, very busy here already this year. Um, and it seems like it's trending upward, obviously, um, but the city is getting busier and it's getting more full, um, you know, with the, the rise in, you know, they're, they're, they're building up in the center city. So we're getting an infl influx of people. And, um, you know, like you ladies were talking about earlier, people come into the city to buy drugs, people come into the city um, to bring in drugs. So it's like a, a thorough way, it's a passageway for the drug community. Um, and it's a big problem, it really is. Um, so 
you know, the strategy and tactics that we have here are education, prevention and treatment, um, community outreach, Narcan training. Um, our fire department now carries Narcan, our police department carries Narcan, and then obviously we do too. So the police department, they a lot of times get to the scene before we do because they're on the road driving around. A lot of times, if we're not actively on a call or leaving the hospital, driving back from the hospital, we're housed in our fire departments. Um, same with the fire department, we're all kind of housed together in our stations. So the, the police department, they are out driving around. So they get to calls before us and um, they're now trained to recognize what a heroin overdose looks like based on their presentation and how they're, you know, how they're acting and such. So they are trained to administer Narcan and assist ventilations to the person before we get there. And then once we get there, if they need more, more treatment, um, then we'll provide it for them. A lot of the times though, now that they're administering the Narcan, the person is awake when we get there, which is great because um, the longer the person is <clears throat> unresponsive, the longer they go without oxygen, which can cause a brain injury, which is a bigger problem for us and for them in the long, the long term. So, um, you know, some tactics, like I said, community outreach, um, education, informing the public about the dangers of, <clears throat> excuse me, opioid abuse. Um, you know, and like I was talking, um, you know, to Terry earlier about, um, about this, these new synthetic drugs that people are using, you know, it's not just marijuana anymore that the kids are using as like a gateway drug to, um, you know, when they're in school, there's these synthetic, the synthetic marijuana that's K2. It's very dangerous because people are putting whatever they can get their hands on into these drugs. You know, they're using like ground up plastic and putting it into the, the marijuana and people, um, they go and buy it thinking that it's regular marijuana, like they've smoked every day for the past, you know, X amount of years. And now they're smoking this K2 and it's having like severe effects on their lungs. You know, they're, they're having like acute lung injury. Um, they're having, you know, problems with their, their brain. So it's, there's a lot of dangers that go into buying street drugs. Um, you know, also, um, uh, talking to the community and talking to schools about, um, you know, prescription opioids are just as deadly and just as dangerous as street drugs, you know, such as heroin, PCP, K2, all of those, um, cocaine. Um, you know, people think that because a doctor prescribes it, it's okay. Um, but the truth is that you can get hooked on it just as easily, just as quickly, and it can become just as deadly. So, um, and that's the, that's really what we're seeing. If anything from high school kids is that they're, they're starting with pills. We don't really see a lot of high school kids that are using heroin. Um, they're, they're doing like marijuana. They're starting with pills like, um, like Oxycontin or Xanax, stuff like that. And they're combining those kind of medications, kind of like dipping their toes in the water, if you will. Um, but they don't really like, those are kind of like the gateway drugs. They're not really getting into the hard stuff until they get a little older. Um, so part of the community outreach would be getting into the schools, talking to them and notifying them of the dangers of these um, gateway drugs and telling them that, you know, if you don't stop now, this is what it's gonna be in a couple of years if you don't, you know, knock it off now. Um, you know, we also have, we do carry these cards here. I brought one with me home. Um, so it's uh, treatment trends. Um, I'm not sure, Bill, if you're familiar with treatment trends, um, but so we carry these in the ambulance. Anybody who, um, wants assistance or you know hints at wanting assistance, we give them these business cards for treatment trends. And it has on the back, um, I know probably no one can read that, but <clears throat> on the back, it has all of like the, um, the treatment centers in Allentown and um, with their phone numbers and their addresses. So we can lead them into recovery if they are willing to help themselves, um, however. With that being said, they um, we cannot help somebody if they are not willing to help themselves. And that is the biggest problem that we run into with these folks here um, is that you can lead a horse to water, but you cannot make them drink. Um, we can do everything, uh, you know, up to and including literally saving their life. But 
they will leave the hospital in 30 minutes and go and do it again. So uh, we also run into like compassion fatigue for these people too, because um, you know they will cry that they want help and we will find them unresponsive with these in their pockets or laying next to them because we will see them and take them to the hospital and hear their stories and we have compassion for them and we treat them and we hold their hands and we wipe their tears and they leave the hospital and they do it again. And you know, there's a lot of times where we find these people and they're not so fortunate where people don't find them, people don't call for them, they step over them and they continue walking and we find them dead. So, you know, we've, we run into some of our providers are not as compassionate and it's very hard to be um, when, you know, you see this every day and you can't really have a bleeding heart for, you know, everybody. You can't really take this stuff home. Otherwise, you'll drive yourself crazy. So you have to have a, you know, there's a fine line between having compassion for someone and, um, you know, sympathizing and being being personally invested in everybody's lives. And that was a hard lesson that I learned uh, a little while ago, was becoming personally invested in everybody's situation. Um, so we do have a lot of recurrent patients, um, sometimes two or three times daily. And um, we see that uptick in, um, in the summer. Um, and our main like corridor for drugs is right along 7th Street. Um, I'm not sure if how many people are familiar with Allentown Center City, but like right where the um, like the statue is, right where the 7-Eleven is, that's kind of like our main our main area. So I do have a heat map. I just learned how to do this. Um, our heat map is to show you where most of our Narcan administrations are and most of our heroin overdoses are. So let me just share my screen here. And can everybody see that? It's kind of like a, an aerial topographical view. So the, let's see if I can zoom in just a little bit. So this is all, um, all this here is all center city. So, and then over here, this is the Jordan Creek here. And then this is over here and we call it the ward um, over on like the east side where like um, Elias Market is over um, like third, second street a Ridge Avenue right over here, but this is all Center City. Um, 4th Street, 5th Street, up to Tillman, Allen, and then down to like um, uh, just under Hamilton Street. So it kind of branches out a little bit to the west, but like this is all over here, this is all deep west. So it's all just in the, just in that little circle there, just in that little, just in that little area, so. So um, that's about, I talked really fast, but <laughs> um, that's about all I have for you. Um, you know, we see this stuff, we see this stuff every day. Um, we cycle our Narcan a lot. Um, a lot of people, you know, depending on how much they take or what kind of, um, what kind of op opioid they use. So if they use like heroin or if they use, um, like fentanyl, if they get like into straight fentanyl, it'll take several doses of Narcan to wake them up. Um, and then at the hospital, they'll have to go on like a Narcan drip um, to keep them awake. So basically what happens in the body is um, you have like these um, pain receptors. And if you can picture like, um, so like picture like you have, this is your receptor here and like a ball sits on top, like kind of like this. And um, so the, the opioid comes in it like latches down like this and then the narcan comes off and goes i don't think so <laughs> and it latches down on top like that and it blocks the pain receptor from from anything latching onto it and that's what it does and that's what and narcan blocks any opioids from latching onto those pain receptors so if you take too much then it's kind of it becomes a battle of like which one is going to which one is going to get it basically so um Shannon, <laughs> you take some questions some specific questions now about some of the things you spoke about and then we'll go to bill sure okay does anyone have any questions pat swan 
unmute yourself and ask questions. Uh, this is Ann Bartholomew. Oh, okay. Go ahead, Ann, and then oh. Pat. Okay. Do the data uh, show which other communities in the Lehigh County area or Lehigh Valley area are the most problematic other than Allentown? No, so we only have the data and statistics for the city of Allentown. Um, I'm sure if I um, like collaborated with other organizations in the Lehigh County, we could get that for you. Um, but as of today, I only have the, the information from Allentown. So this is just literally just the city of Allentown within the city limits. Hmm. If you had that data, um, would it be worthwhile getting citizens like us to push our local communities to be providing money that covers part at least of the cost of treating the out-of-towners who come into your system? Mm. <laughs> um, probably not because they come in and they take their drugs and they leave. So, and they come from all over. We get people from New York, Reading, um, ev everywhere. And you know, like I said earlier, Allentown is like uh, a thorough way, you know, because we have this, we have 70 and 22, um, you know, people just pass on through, they drop their drugs off. Um, you know, those dealers come in from major cities and, um, you know, I'm friends with um, a DEA agent who kind of gives me some of this information um, where he goes to, you know, he just came out, um, flew back from California from tracking somebody all the way from here to pick up that they were going out to buy some major drugs and bring back. So um, I don't, I don't think, I don't think so. Um, I don't want to deter you from doing anything that you're compassionate about. Um, but I, me personally, probably not because you're, that's a big task that you would be taking on. I think something bigger than our community. Uh, I, I was wondering about the different age groups that you would find. Are they mostly people in their 20s or 30s? Do you get people, you know, retired people, old, old, old people? <laughs> we, we do get lifers. We, <laughs> we do. So um, a lot of the, we know, we don't really see a lot of, um, you know, school age kids. Um, they're still kind of in the um, like marijuana phase. They haven't really gotten into any of the hard drugs yet. So we do see a lot of people who have, they're like out of high school, um, they're in their twenties. And then we have a range all the way up to people that are in their seventies and eighties that have never stopped and have lucky enough to made it that long. Shannon, do you want to kind of explain to everyone um, what fentanyl is and kind of how the, the pot the kids are using now is a lot different than what maybe we were exposed to when we were um, high school, college age? Sure. Sorry, I had to let my dog out. <laughs> oh, <that's okay. laughs> um, sure. So we actually, I don't want to, I don't want to scare anybody into, um, into, thinking that fentanyl is a bad drug when we, if anyone would ever need an ambulance and we would give you pain medicine, we do carry fentanyl. However, ours is FDA approved. <laughs> so the fentanyl that's on the street is pure. It is uncut and it is not FDA approved. So that means that it is extremely strong. It's unregulated and it is, um, 800 times stronger than morphine. So it's, um, and it's a synthetic drug as well. It's man-made. Um, and um, I'm sorry, what was your other question about marijuana? Oh, the other question <laughs> is how, how the marijuana or the pot is different nowadays for the kids that are using it than it was maybe 20, 25 years ago. Okay, so um, they do still have the regular mar marijuana, if you will, um, just made from the regular um, pot leaf. Um, and then they have the synthetic marijuana, which is called K2. And that is, um, that's also, anything synthetic is man-made. Um, they um, will take anything they can basically get their hands on and they'll mix it into the 
marijuana into the pot leaves. So they'll cut it with like ground up plastic. They'll, um, they'll they sometimes they'll put cocaine in it. They'll put PCP in it. They'll put oregano in it because it looks like marijuana. So they'll like bulk it up to make it look more, to make it weigh more, so they can charge more. Um, it's the things that drug dealers do are just absurd. Um, and then you're inhaling it into your lungs and, um, you know, you can cause an acute lung injury. And those are actually on the flip side. Those are the people that I transport at Penn Medicine. Those are the people that we go to those, the small remote hospitals and fly back to Penn on vents because they have acute lung injuries. So um, anything synthetic is man-made which you should never trust, especially when you're buying from a drug dealer. <laughs> and um, fentanyl is 800 times stronger than morphine and K2 is synthetic man-made and they'll put anything in it to charge you more, to make you higher. And it's way more dangerous. Trisha sat her hand up for a while. Chris? Trisha, oh, okay. you're muted. There? Good. Okay. Um, I'm kind of a newbie at the whole Zoom thing. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank uh, her for the presentation, which was remarkably clear spoken and, uh, and very, very informative, especially the little illustration of the battle between Narcon <laughs> on the pain receptor. Well, you know, when you do that kind of thing, it really drives the message home. So um, I'd like to ask about. Uh, included in your community outreach uh, in your preventative stuff. You had the Narcon and you had the education, community outreach, and, uh, and you had uh, the, the business card with treatment trends and the various options that people could use if they wanted to make the transition. Um, have, I wanna know how you feel about the safe injection sites, uh, which have been uh, started in several locations. Uh, New York is using them, and the concept of having a medical person uh, on site, um, you know, uh, checking some vitals and providing clean needles and so forth, and you know the person can like go behind the curtain uh, and shoot up, but they're always in the presence of a uh, of a of a medical person, and with each contact with that medical person when they come to the safe injection site, usually for the purpose of getting the needle, the works, uh, then uh, they keep hearing the message of, we can get a bed for you uh, at a facility if, whenever you're ready to you know, uh, kick the habit or make the change or make the transition. And, uh, and it has resulted in some people moving toward uh, recovery who might not have otherwise. I'd like to know how you feel about safe injection sites in the Lehigh Valley. Um, would, they, would they be ben of benefit? Uh, and I know it's a hot button item. People, some people feel it just provides a, um, just provides a location where people can come and get high, but it provides a location where people can come and get high, which they're gonna do anyway, safely, and they're continually receiving a message from somebody, a, a spoken message from somebody. Whenever you want to, we can help you find a bed in a, in a facility. We can help you with the recovery. Uh, we can find a space for you. Uh, and those kinds of things have made a difference in some places. How do you feel about that as a medical person? So um, me personally, I think that, um, it's just aiding people in, it's just allowing them to continue their habits. Um, you're not, people are never going to hit rock bottom if you, you know, provide all of their bad habits for them. Like if you're handing them all of the stuff they need, then they're never gonna want to get better because they're like, oh, well, now I have it right here at my fingertips. You're handing it to me on a silver platter. That's my personal opinion. I'm not trying to sway anybody else. Nobody, you know, I, I'm not, I don't wanna upset anybody by saying that. Um, and also, like I said earlier, we are a very, very busy service. And if we had that in Allentown, that would be, that would need to be staffed 24 seven. 
that would absolutely need to be staffed 24 seven. And we are stretched completely thin. We, like I, um, I worked night shift um, and I came home and I just slept for four and a half hours. And then I worked tonight again. Like we, um, we have very, very minimal staffing right now. Um, people got very fed up after COVID um, and a lot of people left, you know, to put it plainly, they left, they found jobs elsewhere. Um, so, well, everything's uh, yeah. And so if we would do that in Allentown, I think it would cause a lot of resentment with our staff members. Um, and I think that it would absolutely need to be staffed 24 seven. Otherwise, um, things would go sideways very quickly. <laughs> and what I like to do is move on to Bill because we're running a little short of time. And Shannon's right, it is a very personal decision uh, about um, clean needle sites. It's something that will be discussed a lot. But I think right now what I'd like to do if you don't have any other questions for Shannon, Shannon, that was very alarming. I'm guessing the number, we've talked about it before, the number during COVID, it, it just almost doubled because of the isolation factor, people not being around other people, not having peers to help them. It's uh, very um, alarming. So actually the, um, I have a, some data and statistics from Eric Gratz and he ran the numbers in 2020. And there's really no correlation between COVID and heroin. I think it's just, um, you know, we have a lot of, there's just the population density. Oh, okay. Is a lot more. And we have a lot more um, drug choices too. So. That's a little frightening. It is frightening. <laughs> Very frightening. And we appreciate what you're doing, especially, um, like you said, losing staff. Uh, this is yeah. not where you want to lose staff. No. Emergency management services. So we, we thank you. Stay, don't go anywhere. People may have more questions. But what I'd like to do is now have Bill um, address what happens next, what's going on, and what we need. OK. Hang in there, Shannon. And Bill, go ahead. All right, thank you. Quite a, quite an interesting conversation so far. So, as my intro said, I'm a person in long term recovery, lifelong uh, Lehigh County resident. And by the way, thank you for all of your work. I also haven't missed a vote since I was 18, and I've used your guide may, uh, many a time. So, I appreciate the the work that you all do. Um, so, in my career, I actually I ran a longer term residential treatment program in Center City, Allentown, for 14 years. Uh, and an outpatient over the Lehigh County border in Northampton County for a decade. Um, and on, on the issues here, I, I sat on a committee with Jim Martin uh, and Scott Grimm uh, look statewide looking at the impact of overdoses and the types of things that were happening uh, and it testified in front of the United States Senate on older adults uh, and uh, opioids, which I also wrote a college course on, uh, testified in front of the General Assembly on COVID and addiction impacts uh, uh, last year, and also uh, worked on a lack of adolescent care, as well as most recently wrote an article uh, that uh, with the Purdue Pharma Bankruptcy uh, Committee Chair on the lack of funding for addiction treatment in America. Um, so I'm a person in long-term recovery. I started using drugs at 11. Um, I grew up around here. Came from a decent family. Dad worked for the steel. Mom was a church secretary. Um, the problem was that I was around older kids. And one of the things that older kids do when they don't want a younger kid to tell on you, them is they have the younger kid do the same thing that they were doing. Uh, and that started me. I also have some genetics. We do know that addiction has a genetic component to it. Uh, and so trauma, uh, Genetics and age of onset are some major factors in who becomes addicted. Addiction is a brain disorder. It affects the areas of the brain having to do with cognition and motivation. So the area of the brain that we all use, when we look at someone who has overdosed uh, and we think we just saved their life, so they should be grateful and want help right now, 
that's not what's happening in their brain at that moment. What's happening in their brain at that moment is that their brain is screaming for more drugs and it overrides executive function. And so we need to remember that. There is some movement uh, on services so that we can stick with people uh, and help them get services quicker. But in America, we, we don't have the kinds of services that effectively treat people that we should. And I, I, think, I think that's an important element of this conversation. The National Institute on Drug Abuse indicates the minimum dose of effective care for the average person when an addiction is 90 days. So to begin to get to the brain, a person has to have 90 days of treatment. Most people are getting much less than that, about five days, 10 days, 12 days, somewhere in there. There are long-term uh, fights on these things. I was involved in something called Act 106, which is an insurance mandate in the state of Pennsylvania. We started that fight in 1989. It went all the way to the state Supreme Court. Most of the major insurance companies in Pennsylvania fought it. I've personally known people who died because their insurance companies didn't, uh, did not provide what legally they were told to provide, and those individuals died. Um, and we now have that in, uh, enforced by the state Supreme Court. That's roughly one third of all insurance plans in, in the state of Pennsylvania. We also have something called the Parity Act, which is a national act uh, requiring uh, all insurance companies that have med surge benefits uh, and behavioral health services to cover addiction in parity with other conditions. Uh, Marty Walsh, uh, talking about politics, Marty, Marty Walsh is uh, the Biden administration's Department of Labor Secretary. He's the highest recovering person ever uh, to receive uh, in, in, in government, as far as we know, the, the highest openly recovering person uh, in any government here. And, he recently actually looked at this Parity Act and that uh, zero companies, zero insurance companies in America had been in compliance with this law on first review. Uh, and some of them were, were rather poor. So we were not providing care for people. And then we expect them to get better from a brain condition that affects cognition. So we, we have to think about that. And I definitely get the compassion fatigue because I have spent most of my life working with and treating people. Uh, I've lost two immediate family members uh, and, and a lot of people to this. But I also know that there's 23 million Americans in recovery. And then when we do get better, we do amazing things. And part of what we're trying to do is change the narrative so that people understand if we begin to provide the kinds of services that people need from the, the minute we identify that they have an addiction to begin to connect with them and stay with them to the point where they are able to sustain recovery, uh, that we could get many, many more people uh, with addiction into recovery. And why would we wanna do this? A uh, is because it is one in three Pennsylvania families so this is not an uncommon problem. It's one we don't talk about because there is such stigma. The people coming into Allentown from those surrounding communities, it's simply that the market is here. It affects all of our families at some level. Uh, and it's our most, it's most expensive public health problem. The, the Trump administration actually estimated that the opioid epidemic was costing 3% of gross domestic product. It was 3% of everything that we produced in the United States, what 3% of that was taken off just by the impact of the overdose epidemic, alcohol is killing more people than that. Alcohol mortality went up 26% last year across America. Um, and there is no area that is not impacted by this. The fact that I got into recovery at 21 moved me from being somebody who would have been dead uh, a frequent flyer in, with the paramedics uh, or a huge cost to our, our medical and human service system turned me into somebody who is now an active citizen and engaged in my community. The more people that we're able to do that with, the better. 
we've generally in America had what we would call a supply. We, we focused on, on reducing supply. So we've tried to uh, eliminate the supply. It, any kind of basic economics, we have to understand that where there's a demand, the supply will always rise to meet that demand. Um, and so we have to get to people and support their recovery process, of which we have done in America a poor job at, if we're going to change this. Some of what we know um, is that when we start to focus on recovery, so, so when I hit five years of recovery at age 26, the, the statistics, as we're now understanding, show that I had an 85% chance of staying in recovery for the rest of my life. Um, and, and one of the ideas that we're trying to change is that we should be starting to think about long-term services and support and sticking with people because it's actually less expensive from an economic standpoint and as well as from a social standpoint than what we're doing now. Because again, this is driving, um, this is driving economic cost in America. There's a group called uh, the National Center on Addiction and Substance Abuse in the night in the uh, in the 2000s. It did two studies on addiction and their impact on state budgets. Uh, and roughly a third of our budget can be associated of our state budget can be associated with addiction in one way or another. The criminal justice, social service, medical, all of those different things. About one cent of that is spent on treatment. 98 and a half cents are spent on shoveling up the disaster and about a half cent on prevention and other things. So, so we, we have the wrong emphasis here on where we're spending resources when we could have more people in recovery and, and the, that we don't provide the minimum dose of effective care. I would put it this way to you. If you go to a doctor, with an infection and the doctor knows, as NIDA knows that we need 90 days as a minimum dose, but that physician can only give you because the insurance company or whomever doesn't, doesn't pay for the adequate dose, they can say, listen, we can give you three days worth of antibiotics. On their head, they know you need 10. They give you three days of antibiotics, you don't get better because you don't have the proper dose of care. Two things happen. One, with addiction, you blame yourself uh, because, because we, you know, why didn't that person, why didn't I get better? Why didn't that person get better? The other thing that happens is the problem gets worse. An infection improperly treated with an antibiotic leads to a more resistant infection. Well, that's what we're looking at in America right now is that we do these very, very short stays and we don't stick with people and then it gets much, much worse. Uh, and, and we have to start thinking our way out of that to policy focuses that um, they can consider longer term care and engaging with people from initial engagement to the point where uh, they're well are important. Because of stigma, we tend to not focus on that and think, well, why would we want to spend resources on those people? And in, in my years of treating thousands of people, I don't know how many phone calls that I take from family members explaining like that their family member isn't like those people and talks about getting into a prescription that they shouldn't have got, talks about sexual molestation, leading to substance use that leads to a problem, all kinds of these sorts of things where they explain, well, my family member isn't like those people. This is how it occurred for my family member. The, rea the reality is they're exactly like all of those family members. Um, this is how addiction occurs. You know, at this point, we, you know, we have multi-generational addiction where, where kids are getting into it very young. And we also have what are called deaths of despair in America, which we're recognizing because of some of our loss of community um, and lo loss of connection. The, the, three, the three death groups associated with deaths of despair in America are overdoses, which are the leading cause of death in some age groups, 
alcohol, which we are seeing deaths at an earlier age. Like I'm seeing cirrhosis in patients in their 30s that 20 years ago, I didn't see until people were in their 50s. People are using a lot more and suicide rates. And there is a there is some correlation between suicide rates and, and substance use, if not a full one. But you know, this is what's happening is that people are numbing their pain uh, and we have to we have to address it because it's eroding our community. So, I mean, that that's actually, um, what about, what did I miss here? Um, that we could talk about, we could talk more about the policy and, and, and more about um, addiction. Um, but I don't, I'm not, I wanna make sure that there are time for, uh, for questions here. Bill, could you explain the importance of the recovery uh, services and recovery community, you know, early recovery and post early recovery? Thank you. So, so, so for a person who has addiction, when someone is grappling with that and trying to find their way, connection to a community uh, is really important. How do you find, how do you do things? How do you socialize? How do you cope with life? where do you go for support is very, very important. So one of the newer developments is recovery community organizations and recovery centers um, and, and finding places for people to go where they feel safe, they can form community. And these things look different. We have them in, uh, in col on college campuses, you know, Penn State main campus has a collegiate recovery program where kids in the middle of state college can support their recovery. And I, I don't know if anybody has been there, but it's not a most recovery friendly environment of a town, um, but, but people can support each other. And I think that's a, like a decent analogy. Um, we have them here in the Lehigh Valley and we're seeing some investment in them. But you know, if, you, if you provide somebody treatment and they get out of the treatment and, and they don't have a community to connect with and everybody around them is using, I mean, I'm rare. I, I got into recovery at 21. I, it became very clear I was going to die. And I avoided everybody. I, I, I volunteered at Habitat for Humanity, you know, stayed away from people who are using it, and I went to meetings. Uh, and I, I lived. Most people don't do that because they end up gravitating back to their old friends and their old situations. So these recovery communities are places to sort of nurture that new community. So, did I answer your question, Maria? Yes, yes, yeah. Um, yeah, I, I just wanted to throw in, I was speaking to the Lehigh County commissioners trying to get money for an adolescent program, and I came across an, an equation from SAMHSA, which Bill could explain what that is and what it does. But what you did is you took the number of people who were involved in addiction services through the county, and you took that number and what you added to it is how many people miss work? How many family members miss work because their family members have overdosed or have um, had problems at home? You look at how this costs the EMS departments. Like Shannon says, you're, sometimes you're going out three times a day for the same person. Um, the cost it, it, it has on them, the prison system, the legal system, child and youth services. And based on the number in Lehigh County, I found out there was a $5 million economic hit on the county, just for the number of people we have in active addiction in Lehigh County. That, if you take that and you <laughs> spread that across the nation, we are not real smart about how we're dealing with this. We need to put money in the right places. And like Bill said, it has to be like a protocol, almost I, I liken it to childhood cancer. They follow that child for five years and there's certain marks that have to be reached. And I mean, you could explain that better than I could because it's, it's pretty much your idea, <laughs> but that's what we're not doing. And this is having a huge economic hit on families and governments. And now you have people leaving, like Shannon said, you have people leaving EMS. And it's the, the problem is just multiplying and multiplying. I don't know how you would address that bill. I mean, that was just one example of something that I prepared for the county commissioners. Well, thank you for that. I think, I think you know, getting people to think about this differently and the fact that 
we can and do recover is important. And I didn't come up with the idea of the five-year paradigm. A guy named Dr. Robert DuPont, um, who was the first drug czar in the U.S. and ran the impaired professional programs for physicians and other groups, he, he ran the studies on that, came up with this idea of starting to focus on five years recovery with Bill White. So, um, so thinking about what do people need to do to get into recovery and stay in recovery is a, is a paradigm shift from looking at the devastation up front uh, and focusing on, well, okay, we do know that people get in recovery. What are they, how do they get there and how do we support more of that? And that's where, you know, we're talking about uh, safe injection sites. It wouldn't be my primary investment, but it is certainly an opportunity to engage someone and tell them we love them and that there's a different way of living. Because um, we know they're going to be using anyway um, where they fit and the demographics, because you know people won't travel. They're not going to get in their car and travel 10 miles to go to a safe place to inject. So where they go and how often uh, people go there, I, I think, would become a matter of discussion. But the idea of engaging people who are actively using is one we have to start talking about more. <clears throat> Okay, how about some questions for Shannon and Bill? There's a lot of information I know you got, and this is a really serious topic, and it affects, like Bill said, one out of every three families. So if we're just looking at the number of people here, um, I, I'm sure at least six of you have had friends, family, mothers, fathers, brothers, sisters, best friends. So it's something that affects all of us. So you have some more questions for Bill and Shannon. Um, Raise your hands. <laughs> Fran, you wanna go ahead? You're, you're on mute. Fran, you're muted. Okay. Okay. All right, um, would you one more time repeat uh, the little uh, information you said about uh, in terms of the breakdown of where the monies go for care? You said something about one cent goes to this, 98 and a half cents. Yeah, that was, a, that was a study. It's an older study. So the numbers are a bit off, but it was done by the National Center on uh, Addiction and Substance Abuse. And what it showed is about 90, it's probably worse if anything, but 98, for every dollar spent by a state, they estimated that 98 and a half cents went to shoveling up the problem, whether it be medical, criminal justice, and hum or human service. And about a penny went for treatment and the remaining half penny went to the ancillary services. And that was a study I could get, it was called Shoveling Up, and it was a group called CASA who did it. Mm -hmm. And who was it again? One more time. CASA, the National Center for Addiction and Substance Abuse. Okay. Mary Sue, you have a question? Uh, yes, for Shannon. You hear me? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Uh, Shannon, you talked about compassion fatigue. I'd like to know how how you um, how you deal with that, and is there any program to help the the people in your situation? Um, deal with it and maintain your status at your... <laughs> so um, me personally, I, um, I just tell myself that um, I'm here to do a job. I'm not here to judge people and everybody deserves to live. So that's how I, <clears throat> that's how I operate on a daily basis. Um, so every call I go to, whether it's domestic violence or it's drugs or anything. Um, I'm not there to judge, I'm there to do a job. So I just have to put my blinders up and do my job and move on to the next one. Um, and like I said earlier too, um, you can't become personally invested in everybody's situation. Otherwise you will find yourself spiraling out of control. And I found that out the hard way a couple of years ago. Um, we do have services offered to police, fire, and EMS. It's called um, the EAP, and it's called the Employee Assistance Program. And so if you need help, you can go to them, and they'll get you directed into um, 
the, a therapist that um, is um, basically fits your needs, um, whether it's if you are um, treating self-treating with drugs yourself or alcohol, or if you're depressed or anything like that, if work is getting to you, um, manifesting in your dream, something like that, because that does happen a lot. If you have something that's very traumatizing at work, you come home, you go to sleep. A lot of times it does manifest in your dreams. So the employee assistance program um, is offered to everybody um, all the time. We have posters up everywhere at every station. Um, so, and a lot of times too, we come back and we talk to each other about stuff to kind of get it off of our chest right away. Okay, thank you. Uh, I have a question. Bill, what, what kind of hope is there? Do you see any improvements coming down the, the road through, uh, even through Harrisburg? I mean, I know that, I, I don't think they're aware of the, how badly the adolescent programs um, have disappeared. That's another yeah. sad thing. We did lose most of our adolescence program, and I ran a, a, a hearing for the General Assembly on that a few years ago. I mean, there is some now talk about increasing services for adolescents. I mean, just a way to think about this, if you, um, with any kind of a medical condition, one would want to get in an intervention early. The longer that you wait for any, any condition, the harder it is to treat. And we generally wait fairly long to address addiction. So we would want to get in most young people are, that's where experimentation is occurring. That's where first people are first getting into programs. So expanding care for adolescents um, is important because of some funding uh, facets in the last few years that the kind of workforce problems that um, Shannon talked about are also in the addictions services workforce too, is it that a lot of these programs have low paying jobs uh, services to young people tend to be more expensive, so a lot of them converted to adults, and and so increasing services there are important. Um, I, I mean, I think the hope is that we're talking about this more now, but you know, we we're, we're definitely seeing an increase in use. Um, alcohol sales were up thirty percent across Pennsylvania, so we we know that more people are going to get into trouble. So we're sort of bracing for that even while we're expanding our services to people and talking about the reality that recovery is probable. Like if, if we stick with people, they can and do recover. Shannon, I have a question. Um, what kind of things is the city doing as far as getting into the schools? I know it's really hard right now because of COVID, they don't want anyone in, the, in their doorways, but um, is there anything going on? No, not that I know of, but um, I do work night shift. I work 6 p.m. to 6 a.m. So um, the bosses are gone before mm -hmm. I come in and, you know, we, we really don't see each other at, at all. Unless, um, I think you have corresponded with Mamet Barzev, our chief, mm -hmm. who took over for Eric. Um, mm -hmm. Unless he stays late once in a while, I really don't see him at all. Um, you know, he's gone before I come in and then I'm gone before he comes in. So, um, and a lot of the times, if there is some kind of like community outreach program that's going on, um, it'll be offered to us to go do it. And there hasn't really been anything offered lately. And a lot of that is because of COVID. A lot of stuff has been shut down lately. So, right. um, it would be something, um, he always is open to discussions and suggestions and it would be, um, after this meeting, um, he is busy today. So um, tomorrow I can talk to him about possibly putting together some type of program to get into the schools. So um, I think it would be a good idea. Okay. Uh, the, Guardian program at all? the Blue Guardian program? Yeah. yeah. Um, no, I actually don't even know what that is. Okay. Uh, Bill, you, you might want to address that so people know there is something going on. Yeah, it, it's actually, I mean, and I'm, I'm not involved with it um, directly, but the Blue Guardian program, I believe, you know, Jim Martin, um, the Lehigh County Drug and Alcohol uh, Unit, uh, what's called our single county authority, uh, and our treatment providers came together. And what's happening is when somebody does have an overdose, the Blue Guardians is a program where they, they visit the person the day after and they stay with them to get them reconnected to services. Because like I said, when somebody is in withdrawal, when you, when you, the way that Narcan works is it, exactly as Shannon described, 
but it throws the person into withdrawal. So they're actually at their least receptive. And, and by the way, we are at our worst um, when we when Shannon sees our my people, we're at our worst. Seeing <laughs> us when we're you know better may help. Um, but but the the Blue Guardian program will stick with people and 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 get more of them into care because they, they have that conversation with them longer term and they're finding it's it's effective. Yeah, I know that treatment trends goes out on the street and they do what's called harm reduction, even if they show up like at a laundromat and they give people some money for the laundromat, some snacks, socks if they need them. Anything like that helps to engage with this community and then hopefully they build trust and maybe when they hand those cards out, maybe eventually, you know, they'll take a look at it and, and make a move. But it's, there's a lot going on in the city, both from the EMS and um, the Blue Guardian program, people out on the street, walking the street, talking to people that are in active addiction and like Bill said, recovery services. So uh, it's, it's a big problem and there's a lot going on, but we need a lot more and um, yeah. Yeah. I don't even you know. know where I, I would just also say, Mary, you know, like addiction is hell on earth, and I've i I've, I've I've lived in addiction, and when you're there, it you know you you it's it's painful, and you know that the thing that you're taking to numb you is killing you, but you're afraid of that other option. So it's not, it's not like these people are. They're they're not experiencing it as living okay, but but they're they feel trapped uh, and they they don't their brain isn't telling them that that other things will work so it's, it's a really tricky situation um would either one of you to kind of wrap up want to give advice to anybody here who might have issues going on in their family like what to do what's the next step um how can they help uh, that would be a nice way to end i i would just say that I, go ahead no, I was going to say, Bill, that kind of sounds like your wheelhouse. <laughs> yeah, I, I, unfortunately, there are actually unscrupulous people out there. So I generally give them two numbers. One is our Department of Drug and Alcohol. But the, the Pennsylvania State Department of Drug and Alcohol has a 24-hour number. It's 1-800-662-4357, which is HELP. So it's 1-800-662-HELP. And then the Lehigh County Single County Authority. So there's a funding for people to get help and that's run by our county government and their phone number is 610-782-3555. So I generally have people go through referrals through our state or county because there's actually, there's this whole thing on patient brokering that would be another hour where, where bad things are happening with, with that. Okay, anyone have any other questions, comments? Trish has her hand up. Yes, I'd just like to say thank you to all of you, the people who organized this uh, Hot Topics, uh, and also the people who were, anybody, all of you who were involved in the presentation, and it must seem from time to time that you are a voice calling out in, from the wilderness, but please keep calling because our society needs to hear your voices from all angles, from the recovery, from the medical, from the social work, from the community, the, the, communi uh, the community at large, our society needs to hear your voices. So keep at it. It's a, it's a wonderful work that you do. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. And, Anne, you have a question, comment? You're on mute, Anne. Here we go. Um, this is really interesting information. Can we get a synopsis of a lot of it to put into our newsletter, um, talking about um, some of the data, some of the statistics, uh, the the, um, the impact on uh, the economy of this, and of course the uh, the way to get in touch with services if you know somebody who needs them. Um, yeah, if Shannon and Bill want to send me anything that I could use, I had volunteered to do the follow-up article on this for our newsletter. So um, if you want to send me some of your facts and figures, I'll put it into a narrative form and um, 
with the numbers that you mentioned, Bill, and uh, some of the other uh, community services. It's, it's a valuable, it's a, it's a good question and a good comment. Yeah, I'm thinking there's not a whole lot of people listening in and we should all be interested in this topic. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, I'll do that. Thank you. Yeah, and it worked tonight, so I can send it to you. And it will be recorded so that our other members who couldn't make it today um, will be able to read it or listen. And Terry, it will be on our Facebook, I mean, our uh, YouTube channel. On YouTube, and you can find the link in the website. Okay, so I will send, I can it to send out an email as well. Okay, great, great. So if they have the link, then, you know, Bill and Shannon can share, share it as well. Okay, uh, any other questions, comments? Okay, I wanna thank Shannon and Bill so much for uh, preparing and spending time talking about a topic that does affect one in three families. And um, it's very important that we bring it up and it's very important that we bring it out in the open. Um, it's, it's a very, it's very rewarding to me in the little work that I do to see people who I know who have been in prison, who have lost families and are in recovery. And like Bill said, they not only recover, they do great things. They go on to help other people. They go on to found organizations and things like that. People do recover and it's amazing to see what they do when they do recover. So there is hope. Okay. Um, I want to thank both of you. I really do appreciate this. And I appreciate the fact that our board was very interested in hearing about this topic. It's, it is important. Thanks for having us. Yeah, thank yes, you. Certainly, certainly. Thank you very much, very much. And Susan is clapping. Very good. <laughs> uh, yeah, it is, it's, it's an incredibly important topic. Okay. Um, I just want to see if there's anyone who has any committee reports they want to give us um, for the members that are here. Terry, how about the survey? And then sure. Barb. Yeah. Sure. So you're, you're all aware that we sent out the postcard survey. We got a 44% turn rate, return rate, which is not too bad, I guess. Uh, the main two points, I think, with the survey is, was one, how to get action alerts out to our members when say there's a bill that's going to be voted on and we want you to call your legislatures to say you are for or against that bill. And the way we do that is either with direct emails to you, uh, action alerts on our website and action alerts on social media, on our Facebook, Twitter and Instagram accounts. We got kind of a mixed bag return on how many people look at, at um, the website and our social media accounts, but we'll, we'll keep putting action alerts out there for you. The other goal was to find out if folks are reading our newsletter and um, how they most want to receive that information. A few people responded that they would like a hard copy mailed to them of the newsletter, which we will do. We will also start sending you a, a an email with a link to our online newsletter so that you're aware that it's out there. Okay. So that's about it. Thanks, Terry. Barb. Um, thank you. Um, yes. Um, as part of our community outreach, um, we've been able to make contact with two young, really dynamic young women that are now working down at the Lehigh County Board of Elections. Um, Diane Gordian is the deputy, let's see, deputy chief of elections, and Alexandra Sierra, I think she's called the alternate language coordinator, don't quote me on that, um, and they are both have been really interested in partnering with the Lehigh County League to um, do programs in terms of educating voters and uh, getting information out there. Um, it kind of started with they held a number of weeks ago a poll worker recruitment day down at the government office and you know we helped them to get some information out there about that we had a number of league members who actually went down and signed up to become poll workers and get trained and from that we've actually had 
a number of Zoom meetings with them. So we're looking at partnering with them to reach out to neighborhood community organizations, especially obviously in Allentown where they only had a 15% um, voter turnout in this past election. So we're hoping to partner with them to find ways to increase that voter turnout. They were very interesting. They said that there was two things that actually depressed the voter turnout in Allentown, um, lack of knowledge and lack of information. And we said, those are two things that the League of Women Voters can really be helpful with. So we actually have planned already, I believe it's a Friday, March 25th, a Zoom seminar where we're gonna um, partner with them to reach out to these organizations and they'll put the Zoom online. You know, and that'll be information about voting and registration, how to get candidate information. So we're going to do that. And we're also looking forward to um, partnering with them in a number of ways in the next couple months, you know, not just for this election, but looking at the fall too. They're, they're really two dynamic young women, and they are really, really enthusiastic about working with us. So, you know, maybe hopefully we'll be calling on some members too for some of this because we're really thinking we have a lot of work to do. And then that's, right. that's the key thing. We, we are really going to be looking to some of our members for uh, assistance in a lot of these projects. Some are very small, but important projects. So we're probably going to be asking you if you want to join somehow. Um, yep. Rochelle couldn't be here. I mentioned earlier, if you weren't on that, her dog was in some kind of pain. So she was rushing him to the vet. So I told her I would go over the stuff she wanted to mention. Uh, first was a thank you to all the members who made calls or sent emails to your legislators on House Bill 38 and House Bill 2207. Both of them are very undemocratic um, bills. Both of them would be constitutional amendments and the facts are very, um, very firm that if something gets on the ballot, it has more than a 75% chance of being passed. So we want to try to prevent some of these things from even getting on the ballot. One would take the three top courts in the state, split up all the justices into geographical districts, and then you could only vote for the justice for a statewide seat that lives in your district. It basically is called judicial gerrymandering, and we're very much against it. It would be run completely by the legislative branch. The other one, um, 2207, basically takes all the work that was just completed on drawing new districts and throws it out the window in two years and gives all the power to the legislative branch again to come up with a new way to draw districts. And basically the design, it's designed to fail so that whatever committee they have, they get 60 days to do this. Well, they've been working on this for six months. So they know they can't do it in 60 days. So what happens after 60 days, the House draws their own map and the Senate draws their own map and no one has to approve it. So that's, we're very much against that. There are about another 40, 50 bills in the, I'd say in the tube, ready to come out at some time. So we're gonna keep you posted on um, what's happening. Basically what's happening is the Republicans to their credit have come up with a strategy to bypass the governor's veto. And that is by making something a constitutional amendment. If it's a constitutional amendment, um, the governor does not get a veto. So that's really important. What else did you want me to mention? Okay, uh, we are thinking of doing a simple webinar after March 7th. That's the last day that anyone can object to the maps. And we already hear there might be someone objecting to the house district maps. Uh, once everything is settled, we'll have a little webinar and show you what your district looks like, what the new district is, what the numbers look like, and what we're, um, how things are changing. We have two open districts, a Senate district, which is kind of crazy. It runs all the way from Emmaus, all the way up to Bushkill Township and Klecknersville and Danielsville, if you know where that is. Yeah, I see. <laughs> and that's open. There's already someone has thrown their hat in the ring, Tara Zarinsky from Northampton County. And um, we need to educate our voters about that Senate district. Many of you will be in that Senate district and the, the idea is to provide minorities with the chance to have representation in the Senate, but it's, it's a big haul. Uh, and you'll see when we do a webinar, we also have an open house district 
in that's 22 and that is um, more eastern Allentown down to Fountain Hill, I believe. And um, that's open. So because we have two open districts and we're the third largest metropolitan area in the state, the state league is pushing real hard for us to have some kind of a candidates forum or debate, depending on how everything rolls out, how many people want to run in that district. And that's if we do that, we're going to need help from our members. So when you get emails from us, we're looking for help. We, the board can't do it all by ourselves. It's, you know, it, nobody's going to be given a really tough job. We just need to all pitch in. Uh, there's a lot of pressure for us to do this. I can understand it. We don't see open districts too often where there's no incumbent at all. So that's what's coming up. Um, and we did send out our invitations to our legislators for legislative interviews. If you want to jump on an interview, um, we have, some, I think we sent out letters. I think we sent out emails to every legislator by now and we're getting some returns now. If you would like to join us and be on a legislative interview, just send an email to the league or to one of us on the board and we'll make sure we get you to the right interview. These aren't scary. They don't last that long. We have the questions this year a little better, a little more simple. And um, the legislators, actually, most of them really enjoy it. It's a chance to build a relationship with them. So if you're interested, please let us know. Okay. And I, I will tell you today, I had a meeting with Muhlenberg College and the Muhlenberg College I suggested they allow students to go along in the interview and they love the idea. And we already have um, a student coming tomorrow on Mike Schlossberg's interview. And they also, the students also wanna be involved in any of the projects we do with the county, with voter education, voter services. So it looks like we will partner and get some help from the students. They're pretty excited. And they, and they do wanna give us, if you're interested, they had, Muhlenberg had one of the, one of the highest voter turnouts among co college campuses in the nation. So their club, Berg Votes, I asked them if they wanted to talk to us and tell us what they did to get an, I think it was over 80% voter turnout, which is phenomenal. So you'll be hearing information about that, that happened today. So I, I'm actually really interested to see what they did to get 80% of their students voting. I think, I think that's wonderful. It gives me hope in the next generation. I told them we're ready for them to step in. <laughs> so that's all I have. Anyone have any questions or comments before we end? Yes, I have one more thing. The, the county voter office is having another virtual event on Wednesday. It's open from nine in the morning to four in the afternoon. So you can just dial into this event at any time and talk to them about becoming a poll worker. The link for that is on our website under action alerts. So go ahead and check that out if you're interested in being a poll worker. Thanks, Terry. So as you can see, we're really busy. So we're gonna need some help. So if you can talk to even some other members that are friends of yours and let them know that we do are definitely reaching out for a little bit of assistance because we're pretty busy as a board as it is. and. Um, we, we have to kind of communicate that to the state and let them know we're busy, we're trying, we'll do as much as we can. So unless you have any other questions or comments, we'll end for today. And thank you for staying on and being part of this today. Okay, I'll see everyone next month. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.